let's shift gears here and talk a little bit about produce and safety of fresh fruits and vegetables. And today I'm going to be talking specifically about agriculture water and some updates uh, referring to the FISMA produce safety rule. So first of all, why we need to focus on water, I always say that uh, water is the major contributor to fresh produce contamination in the field. Uh, also, post-harvest is a big when, it, when produce is, uh, is washed. Uh, but previous foodborne outbreaks that were linked to fresh produce, they identified that the source of contamination was contaminated water that was used in the field. And, uh, and what water must meet produce safety uh, root requirements? So agricultural water means all the water that is intended to use or is likely to contact the harvestable portion of the crop or food contact surfaces. So when we talk about agricultural water is water that is used for irrigation that is likely or touching the produce, water that is used for fumigation, frost protection, uh, water for, that is used for washing hands and uh, food contact surfaces, and wa water that is used for uh, facilitating washing and even washing produce up and the post-harvest practices. And the water that we talk, the, the major requirement that we that it needs to meet, it's must be safe, adequate sanitary quality for its intended use. So obviously we're not gonna be using water from a pond full of cows to irrigate fresh produce, right? Uh, but also we need to make sure that this water is safe and adequate sanitary condition uh, to use safely use for produce um, production because we eat produce raw. So there's no kill step in between that can uh, ensure microorganisms are killed during the process. So we need to make sure that contamination doesn't happen in the first in instance. And most of you that, uh, that are covered by the produce safety rule or are GAP certified uh, might remember this microbial water quality profile where growers were using, for example, surface water, pond water, creek water, they had to do a 20 sample water sample over a period of two to four years. And, do, and then after that period, they, they need to do a rollover of five samples annually and build the microbial water quality profile in order to comply with the uh, requirements of the rule. Um, if there's something that needed to be changed or if the water quality was compromised, growers should take uh, corrective measures to or stop using the water or treat the water or respect the water system in order to start getting back to the water, to that same water uh, source. Uh, now the FDA stopped uh, that criteria that 20 roll up um, water sampling and the microbial water quality, it's no, it's no longer required as the major component of the uh, agricultural water for pre-harvest. There is a new proposed rule that was uh, released December last year uh, for, for pre-harvest ag water. Harvest and post-harvest, it is still in the same standards. It, ha it hasn't been changed, so there's no, the, the standard is no detectable generic E. coli in the water uh, when they're tested. And, and now the new proposed rule for ag water, it's, it's talking about production water, and there are big changes on that rule. And if you're not covered by the produce safety rule, but you still get food safety certification through 30 parties, Keep in mind that food safety certifications, they follow the regulations. So once the, this new rule, the new proposed rule is finalized, the other food safety certifications will definitely shift gears to follow the regulatory requirements. And so what is new? So I, I mentioned that uh, the rule has changed for production water. So we have some new definitions that growers need to be familiar with. Uh, with the addition of a water assessment plan. So growers need to do a new water assessment of the water source and the whole 
area that is the water that the whole system in in order and documented in order to meet the rec, uh, the regulatory requirements which means a new required record to keep on uh, on your system uh, again no changes to harvest and post harvest requirements or sprout water has been made so this is just for production water for water that is used uh, for pre harvest and this new water assessment is based on the inspection of the water source and water system, maintenance of this water system, and much more. So this new water assessment replaces water testing that was, I just mentioned that the 20 uh, sample per in two to four years, then five following samples every year and the microbial water quality profile. This is no longer a requirement. It's becoming an option. Uh, what is the required is now the water assessment. And keep in mind that GAP certification might still require water testing uh, since the regulation hasn't been finalized yet and the GAP, GAP, GAP certification normally requires a lot more than what the regulation asks. And right now, since the, the regulation is not finalized yet, uh, inspections, inspectors are enforcing discretion for agriculture water compliance states. So growers should be learning at this point how to do water assessments, but they are not going to be inspected right now because the, 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 the rule hasn't been finalized yet. So this is a good time for growers to start getting more familiar and learning how to do the water assessment before they have to do it for documentation and inspection pur uh, purpose. So what, what is this water assessment? Uh, so it, it, it covers different factors. So the first one is the agriculture water system. So growers will be required to document the location and nature of the water source, uh, where, the, where, where the water source is, is placed, down the hill or, uh, or uh, uphill of the of the field. Uh, if you have animals around, it's uphill or down here as well. What is the type of the water source? It's a groundwater, is a surface water. Uh, the type of water distribution, uh, if you have an enclosed systems or if you have a pump that is pulling out of, uh, the, of your creek or of your pond, and how much the system is protected. Um, and maintenance of the system as well. So if you're in a good maintenance or if you're good, uh, if you have a good protected system, uh, if you're using more, more than one water source, so you have to describe each, each water source that you're using. If you have animals on your operation, uh, if you have working animals, grazing animals or um, wild animals or even domesticated animals, you have to report that and where the animals are located um, regarding your, your water. And, and adjacent and nearby land use related to animal activity. So let's say you don't have animal on your farm, but your neighbor five miles away, they have it. It is, you have to report it because it might implicate on the quality of the water that you're receiving on your farm. Also you have to assess Agricultural water practices, what kind of method of irrigation you're using, if you're using overhead or if you're using drip or any kind of other uh, irrigation system. We know that irrigation uh, plays a risk role in, on, on when it's applied to the crop. So let's say if you're using drip irrigation, it's safer than you're using overhead and depending on the crop. Time interval between the last application of the water uh, from the harvest so the closer to the harvest, the higher the risk. Uh, so ha you have to report when, when you do the last water application for your specific crops. Crop characteristic, so susceptible crops uh, to surface adhesion or internalization. So we know that uh, leafy greens are more susceptible to contamination. We see a lot of outbreaks on the news. Um, so we have to report if you have those more uh, riskier crops or not. Environmental conditions, so if you have heavy, heavy rain on your area, if you have flooding events before, or if you know that you have, you're susceptible to flooding, 
or if you have a runoff that is going to your water source and the, anything that impact or damage produce safety. Um, and then we are in the hurricane season right now. So we have to report that as well. We don't often see hurricane in our area, but eventually we have heavy rainfall that could impact you know, the quality of the water. Air temperature, sunlight, uh, UV exposure. So let's say we, uh, down here in Alabama, we have much more sun exposure than, than growers that are in Boston, for example. So we, that's why it is important to report sunlight, UV exposure. And, and any other relevant factors. So that is where water testing results are uh, included here. So water testing is not is no longer a requirement, but it's a it's a it's an optional. So it is to ensure is to show you that all of the things that you report in and it's it's being under uh, control. So. Water testing this is still very important. So this is the only way that you know the quality of the water. If you're having uh, high lows of microorganisms, E. coli, um, and then depending the time of the year. So this is an addition to your water assessment. If you're doing any kind of uh, the, one of those three options here, you don't have to do the water assessments. So if you can demonstrate by using one of the water testing that your water contains no detectable generic E. coli, let's say, for example, you, if you're using groundwater and you've been consistently showing that you have zero generic E. coli on your water, you don't have to do the water assessment. You just have to keep testing and showing that you have zero generic, ge detectable generic E. coli on your water. Or if you're using water from a public supply, like city water, you can show a certificate or test his results from the, from the, um, from city water. And that show that it's meeting microbial standards. So the annual report, you can get the annual report and keep on your record. So if you're using city water and then, and have the, the, the annual test report, you don't have to do the water assessment. Or if you're treating your water, uh, using EPA approved sanitizers. And this is not just chlorinated or shocking or well once in a while. It is, needs to be a validated uh, certified method that it's, it's ensuring over time that it's been an effective method. If you're doing one of these three options, you don't have to do this water assessment that I just mentioned. And after you're doing all the water assessment, uh, you're going to determine if your water is safe or not and the level of safety of the water. So let's say if your water, if you're after your assessment, you, you conclude that the water is not safe at all. You have a heavy animal operation in your farm. You have a lot of runoff and your test results show that you have high loads of E. coli. You need to immediately discontinue the use or use any of the water treatment or any corrective measure to, to fix that problem. Or if you have any, any problem that doesn't need to be immediately, um, if you have any problem that is related to animal activity, um, you need to implement mitigation measures. If you're showing that you have animals around on a farm, but test results are still showing low bacteria count, E. coli counts, then you don't have to immediately discontinue the use, but you have to take mitigation measures to prevent contamination. If you're having um, hazards or risk that is not related to animals, you don't have to take more immediate action you have to test the water to see if that is getting within the, the range. Those, that's the microbial water quality profile is still valid here. So you can do it over time and use it. And if you're identifying that you don't have any risk, then your water source is protected. You just need to do a regular inspect, inspection and maintenance at least once a year. 
And some of the mitigation measures that FDA suggested that you can do is uh, you can you need to maintain and do keep changes or repairs when you see any problems with your water application method or your well cap or on any well system or anything. Or you can increase time interval application between harvest, uh, a minimum four day before harvesting. So you can apply, apply water four days before harvesting. So you will reduce or minimize the risks that are related to contaminated water. You can increase time interval in storage, for example, in onions that are stored for long times that it, it, it accounts for die off of microorganisms. You can use commercial washing, for example, for citrus, but be careful, commercial washing is not for all produce. So it needs to be for a specific and documented. And change water application methods. So let's say if you have a higher risk uh, water, you can use uh, drip irrigation if you are using overhead, let's say. Or you can treat your water, but again, you have to use validated methods and using EPA certified sanitizers for that. Or you can use UV method or non-chemical methods as well, but in a, in a, it has to be validated. Or you can use any other alternative that is scientific based, scientifically validated, so they can minimize or reduce risks. And for post-harvest and pre-harvest, uh, post-harvest and harvesting water, again, no changes has been made, remains the same. So no detectable generic E. coli per water sample. And GAP requires water testing, but also requires SOPs for water use, temperature uh, treatment is required if you're using dump tanks, uh, which is not required for the produce safety rule and monitoring of the treatment that you are adding to the water. So this is this is one thing that you can keep in mind that produce rule, uh, it's, it's, it, it's, it stands for the basic uh, regulatory standards, but GAP normally adds a little bit more. So GAP is already doing the water assessment for the, the, the pre-harvest water. So for growers that are GAP certified, you will not be um, much to add to your uh, to your documentation is going to just need to be a little bit more detailed. And once the, the final rule, once the rule is finalized uh, for pre-harvest water, uh, growers that have business that make more than 500K per year will have nine months to comply with the rule after the rule is proposed. So the rule hasn't been proposed yet. So it hasn't been finalized yet. So after it's finalized, growers that make more than 500K will have nine months to comply. Growers that are between 250 and 500K will have a year and nine months after the effective date. And very small business between 25 and 250K per year, we have two years and nine months after the effective dates to, to be um, in compliance. So within this period, we can start, growers can start working on the water assessment and getting more familiar before the rule is finalized. And for post-harvest and harvest water, and the compliance date since the rule hasn't changed, uh, growers that make more than 500K, the compliance date is January 26 next year. Small businesses, January 25, 26, 24. And very small businesses is January 2025. And for those ones that want to become more familiar with these new water changes and, and regulation and 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 then want to test their water because it's it's is it still important even though it's not going to be required it's still important to keep on a documentation and ensure that the water is safe we have a program that is called egg water safety program that we offer micro fee, free microbial water testing and also we provide educational support to growers to navigate to, through the new requirements so you can scan the QR code here, or you can access the, the link that is here. And you're going to fill up a pre-screening survey, and then you it will reach out to you to provide more information on how to uh, receive the sampling, uh, the sampling kit 
and how to ship it back to us. And it will provide at the end a test result, a report that you can keep, keep on your records. And if you have questions, please let me know, just reach out to me. I'm, I'm open for questions and discussion.